Thank you very much for the kind introduction. And uh, my topic, give, and thank Bansi and the team for inviting me again. And I have got, this is the hostel I work in Kolkata, and my presentation is based on my original work, so I'll try to chip in with some intro. So ICE 2021 is basically my work was accepted for oral presentation and international congress of endocrinology in Buenos Aires. So that was the ICE 2021. So let's start with the pharmacologic treatment because people has got an impression that when we are talking about the guidelines, sulfonylurea has been relegated to insignificance. I think it is an incorrect interpretation of the guideline. If you look carefully in the guideline, then you would see is that the so if you look carefully, that if you have got ACVD or heart failure or CKD, you are starting LGL2 inhibitor and you are starting uh, GLP-1 RA, etc. But what is important is, <coughs> it is not saying that you have to end here. It is, there is enough evidence, so you are starting. But once they are not under control, you have to go to the next. You can see the arrows. And high to very high, you have to use sulfonylurea. So it is basically trying to make a place for each molecule based on evidence. This is not anti to the concept that this is very good for glucotoxicity. But the NICE guidelines tells it very clearly. The opening lines tells you that for symptomatic hyperglycemia, consider sulfonylurea or insulin. Therefore, the thought that sulfonylurea, and especially the mod modern one, have been relegated to insignificance is a wrong concept. If you look at management of hyperglycemia type 2 in RSSDI recommendation, they are probably more rational in trying to put everything together and you need to individualize your patient. So this is not a sponsored lecture, so I'll be talking about the data. This was the, my presentation that was done. And we primarily looked at the durability of sulfonylurea. What I mean is that if you use a modern sulfonylurea in the background of standard of care, then how long the patient remains without starting insulin? And then, of course, a preliminary word that when we talk about the sulfonylurea, they act on the sulfonylurea receptor. And when they act on the receptor, there are many subunits. That's why the variation. This glycolazide acts on the SUR1. As you know, the KTP channels where it acts. Therefore, this is very specific. And that's why you find different sulfonylurea acting on that subunits differently to different uh, level of affiliation and different level of target and specificity. If you look at glimepiride also, they act at the sulcolemal KTP and not the mitochondrial. That's why the different sulfonylurea has got different presentation. So the myth that we have is hypoglycemia, weight gain, beta cell exhaustion, durability of glycemic control, and cardiovascular profile. These are the issues discussed with sulfonylurea for donkey's years. But the main reason is because we had some first generation, they gave us, gave us not so good result. So how do we debunk these uh, concepts? Start with the efficacy. You can see here the sulfonylurea is only next to insulin in terms of efficacy. So therefore, this is a very good molecule and efficacious. In fact, if you look at the market value of sulfonylurea cell in the country, it is 47%. Do you understand that when you talk of a cheap molecule and having 47% in value addition, then how much prescription there should have been? 70 to 80%. Because if you have got an expensive molecule and the value of market share is 40%, then they may be having less prescriptions. Therefore, this valuation again vindicates that sulfonylurea, modern sulfonylurea, you wise people are writing left, right, and center. Let's look at the advanced molecule, advanced study. There is not a, not a bigger study that tells you 91% patient on glycoside and 41% on insulin. And you know in glycolazine, in advanced study, you had 8 plus minus 6, so 2 to 14 years duration of diabetes. You had insignificant hypoglycemia and insignificant weight gain. So therefore, you should remember that per se, it is not the sulfonylurea, the modern sulfonylurea that causes weight gain. 
If you look at the glimepronite data again, you can see here that they also showed in one study that after five, uh, five years, so the main problem is eating habit, relative hypoglycemia, those are causing the weight gains, not the molecule per se. So again, I would say that hypoglycemia, and beta cell exhaustion is a very, very uh, interesting statement that's made very often. Remember that even not now in the UK PDS days, Rudy Holman tells you no solid evidence of beta cell exhaustion in the clinical setting over six years in UK PDS. Therefore, sometimes I hear about squeezing of beta cell is not a right theory. Now let's go to the practice. In vitro, what they did is put pancreatic beta cell line against these molecules control and the venclamide, neoparide, and glycoside. What did they find in vitro? That glycoside and control are comparable. There was no apoptosis, increased apoptosis with glycoside. The, it was the first generation that had more probably. Therefore, again, I debunk the theory that there's a beta cell exhaustion due to feed. It is a progressive disease. There's a natural history of diabetes. Yeah, so again, as I said, that you have got 91% on glycoside, 70%, 74% received metformin, and 40% received insulin. If there has to be an exhaustion, then in advance, all have gone into insulin. And you can see here again the meta-analysis for all-cause mortality and CV mortality. Again, you see glycoside and glimepiride are actually on the safe side of the, so do not hesitate writing this. If you look at the Bronwell's textbook of cardiology, they clearly says exception of glucoside with no associated mortality signal. Therefore, it is wrong to discuss that SCUs have gone into irrelevance. If you look at another meta-analysis, you can see use of SCU not associated with any difference in MI with respect to comparators. And you can see the number of studies, 62 trials are included to come into this conclusion. This is my study, what we looked into 300 patients uh, we longitudinally followed them up. We had 50-50 male and female. And what we wanted to see is durability, efficacy, weight change, and hypoglycemia. What we found is that we conducted this, in this study, uh, the results, I would go for the interest of time, but they were all followed up in our clinic and they were compulsorily on glycoside plus standard of care right from the beginning. And the average duration of follow-up was around uh, 13 years in average, but we had patients more than 20 years on the drug. And we had a structured education for all patients, and descriptive analysis was utilized. This was my paper accepted for world presentation. Now, this the mean age was 55 years in my study. Age beyond C arrived was 7.1, which is very close to the uh, ADA goals, 7%. 82% patient achieved target of less, more, less than 7%. 18.7% had diabetes more than 20 years. So if somebody is on glycoside 100% along with standard of care, trying to propose that they have got apoptosis or more hypoglycemia would be slightly uh, far-fetched. Mean duration of treatment, starting, I, I recruited patients from five years onwards. And only one person, person patient had episodes of minor hypoglycemia. This is the raw data of all the patients. And you can see the distribution across. So every, every sector, whether you look at BMI, you look at duration in terms of year, whether the gender allocation or BMI, we had a well-spread uh, patients in all the things. And the results for your advantage, 16.3% patients in due course required insulin. I'm talking average 10 to 15 years because 12.8 years was the average. So number of patients with BMI, 50% were over, over the 25 and the others were less. So, and we initiated insulin when the age balance was more than 80%. So in this group of patients, so after we got this uh, uh, acceptance, I thought that we'll do in a different cohort of patients at a different background in a different time frame to validate what we have already done. So this was accepted for poster presentation in Lisbon in 2022. And I presented this, we took up another 50 patients. Main purpose was to look at durability. And what we found, our data was number of patients this time was a pilot study, 50, with a history of diabetes 10 to 20 years. And again, male, female was equally distributed, more or less. Number of patients on insulin, 13 out of 50, 37 still on oral hypoglycemic agents and glycoside-based therapy. 
What it means is that this is quite close to my previous understanding and our previous results. Number of patients with diabetes between 10 to 15 years and around 14% went into insulin. In the previous, we had around 13%. <clears throat> Number of patients from 16 to 20 years also we had, and they had over 50% on insulin. Now, the durability of glyclozide is defined as from the start, how long it takes to initiate insulin. So any discussion about apoptosis, any discussion on hypoglycemia and weight change would, would actually come into picture that our and the advanced experience was different. So we tried to conclude from the, these two studies that we observed a sustained glucose lowering attributed to glycoside-based approach demonstrated by majority of the patients which enabled to postpone insulin initiation despite a long duration of diabetes. Overall, the patients achieved a glycemic level close to 7%, which is what we target. Our findings support sustained glycemic control for durability with potential to postpone insulin initiation attributed to extended release glycoside or modern sulfonylurea. So the results are coming from different from the first generation because a lot of data that you see against sulfonylurea comes from the older version of the sulfonylurea, first generation. And the reason it happens is the way it attaches to the sulfonylurea receptor is different to the varying degree. And the outcome is also therefore slightly different in this. This is my recent paper with the uh, Giglio Marchesini published in DRCP. And we looked very clearly, uh, very closely at the metabolic flexibility. Metabolic flexibility, you know that when you are having some nutrition and sources and the body has a capacity to utilize them. And when this metabolic flexibility is impaired, when the body cannot handle the amount of load or tsunami you are giving, then therefore you develop a glucotoxicity and lipotoxicity. Now how this glucotoxicity and lipotoxicity respond to drug, exercise, and dieting is a paper on this. So we try to look at this and we realize Again, the glucotoxicity was a very, very important uh, issue when the drivers of liver and cardiac diseases. Therefore, sulfonylurea addresses the basic, one of the basic pillars of diabetes where glucotoxicity is addressed. Therefore, do not feel ashamed or apologetic if you are using this without, uh, without going against the standard of care. That was the point I wanted to highlight. To sum up, treatment of patients with type 2 diabetes is always individualized. And I'm sure all of our prescription within five years gets us a failure. Evidence and clinical practice have confirmed that SUs are the mainstay in the management of hyperglycemia. All SUs should not be considered the same. As I told you, the receptor affiliation is different. And modern SUs are effective and safe in the patient. If you are still not convinced, cost is also very important. Thank you very much.